So when we look at this scene and we're asked, where is the carbon footprint? We might instinctively point to the gasoline-powered vehicles, aware of the fact that these cars are burning gasoline and emitting CO2. We might point to the electrically powered lights, knowing that that electricity comes from a coal-fired power plant or from natural gas combined cycle. But what we may not realize is that there are so many more sources of CO2 emissions in this picture. There's a CO2 emission behind the, the McDonald's burger. The meat of that patty and the bread of that bun has a CO2 emission behind it. There's a CO2 emission behind the paints on the wall, the plastics of the billboard. There's a CO2 emission behind the fabrics of the clothes that everyone's wearing. So the CO2 emission is ubiquitous. And when it's all added up, it is significant. So we have to pay attention to the CO2 emissions that are behind chemicals and behind materials. So we can look at this problem quantitatively. This plot shows the greenhouse gas emissions in megatons of CO2 equivalent of the top 18 commodity chemicals. That's on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have their production volume. You'll see here that ammonia has an enormous CO2 footprint associated with it. It's so large that it, in fact, has its own y-axis on the right-hand side. So if we're going to be serious about decarbonizing chemical production, we have to find new ways of making ammonia in a more sustainable fashion. So our first instinct might be to just stop making ammonia. If we stopped making ammonia, we'd get rid of that CO2 footprint that's associated with it. But it turns out that ammonia is essential to our quality of life. Ammonia is needed for fertilizers, and those fertilizers go into producing food. Ammonia is needed as a disinfectant and as a cleaner. It's needed to make fabrics. It's needed to make plastics. So it simply isn't possible to stop making that ammonia. We have to find a cleaner and greener way of producing that chemical. The way that we make ammonia today is in a process known as the Haber-Bosch reaction. This is an example of the Haber-Bosch reaction. It's a chemical plant that cost about $2 billion to build. We make all this ammonia in these massive chemical plants, and then we distribute it all around the world. In this process, we start with methane and water. We react these chemicals together, making hydrogen, but in the process, we also end up making CO2. This reaction operates at greater than 700 degrees centigrade, so it's pretty hot. We then take this hydrogen and react it with nitrogen, and in this process, we make ammonia. This happens at 400 to 500 degrees centigrade and 150 to 250 bar. These are really, really high pressures. So the real problem here is that we have an enormous CO2 footprint. You can see where it comes from in the first reaction. And in addition, we have very harsh conditions. And these harsh conditions necessitate that we have centralization of the process. This isn't chemistry with these temperatures and these pressures that you can do in your garage. You're forced to do it in a place where it can be safely conducted at scale. So our vision is to electrify chemical manufacturing. And if we can electrify chemical manufacturing, we might be able to overcome some of these intrinsic problems that we face in producing ammonia today. In this vision, we start with CO2 and nitrogen. These gases can be obtained from air or from exhaust gas. We also have water as a feedstock. We take these feedstocks, which are ubiquitous, they're everywhere, and we use renewable power at ambient conditions, at 25 degrees centigrade and one bar, to make these into diverse chemicals, to make these feedstocks into fertilizers, into paint, into carbon fiber, into fabrics. So we're taking carbon atoms from CO2, nitrogen atoms from dinitrogen gas, we're taking hydrogens and oxygens from water, and we're stitching them together to make all the chemicals and materials that we require in our everyday lives. So we can look specifically at the problem of making ammonia, taking N2 gas from air, taking water, using renewable power at ambient conditions, and making this into ammonia, and generating oxygen as a byproduct. This is a benign byproduct that we don't need to be worried about. You can see here in this image how we might actually be able to do this someday. We have solar panels, which are taking sunlight and making that into electricity. That electricity is then used to convert water from a neighboring source, as you can see on the left-hand side, as well as air from the atmosphere, reacting those two to make ammonia. And that ammonia could then conceivably be used to fertilize a neighboring field, shown on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. 
In this paradigm, there is no CO2 generated. You can see this from the overall reaction. Nitrogen plus water makes ammonia with no CO2 generation. In addition, this process operates at ambient conditions. So you don't need the harsh conditions that were needed for the older thermochemical process. And because of this, you can do this in a distributed fashion. You can make that ammonia close to where you need it. So this might sound like a pie in the sky, science fiction type of idea, something that shouldn't exist, but we've actually developed a prototype of this in my lab here at MIT. We've shown how we can take electricity, we can take nitrogen from air, and we can take water, and convert these into ammonia at ambient conditions. This is a lab scale prototype which operates at the fastest rates that have ever been shown for making ammonia at these sorts of conditions. This is just a first demonstration. There is still so much more work to do to further figure out the science and engineering behind this to make it something that is technically viable. So you might be wondering if using electricity to make ammonia is so promising, especially when that electricity comes from a renewable source, why hasn't this already been used at scale to make all the ammonia in the world? And it turns out that this is because electricity from renewable sources has historically been very expensive. You can see that here, dollars per watt for a solar panel. This was $76 per watt in 1977. We're now down to 25 cents per watt in 2017, and these prices are continuing to drop. So this is a new opportunity that has come about because renewable electricity has gotten so cheap. This isn't just about decarbonization. Here we have dollars per ton of urea. Urea is a fertilizer which contains ammonia. These are countries in sub-Saharan Africa, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Mali, Nigeria, and Senegal. And the prices for urea there are compared to the international average. And you'll see here that the price of fertilizers in sub-Saharan Africa is over twice that in the rest of the world. This is because infrastructure for distribution of fertilizers is lacking in sub-Saharan Africa. This means that fertilizers are more expensive. Because they're more expensive, fields are under-fertilized. Because they're under-fertilized, crop yields are lower. That in turn leads to lower food production. That leads to hunger. Hunger leads to lower workforce productivity. A workforce which, is le has, which has less productivity has fewer economic means to purchase fertilizers, and the vicious cycle continues. A technology which enables the ability to make ammonia locally will help to break this cycle. One will no longer need to rely on distribution infrastructure, which is a failure of governments, and instead, local communities will be able to make their own fertilizers, overcoming these historical challenges. So I've emphasized ammonia so far, but this isn't just about ammonia. We need routes to make ethylene, to make methanol, propylene, ethylene oxide, so many other chemicals that are essential to our way of life. I've shown you so far how we can take nitrogen and water and using renewable power, make that into a fertilizer. We can use this exact same platform that we've developed in our lab to also make diverse chemicals and materials that we rely upon in our everyday lives, to make paints, to make resins, plastics, the fibers of clothing. These are all targets that we're pursuing now in our laboratory. <coughs> MIT is pushing the frontiers of electrifying chemical synthesis. This is a difficult problem, and there's a long road ahead. We need to put together a diverse coalition of entrepreneurs, engineers, scientists, policymakers, and educators who together can help to develop, deliver a future in which we have sustainable materials and chemical manufacturing. Thank you. <laughs>